Yeah, so uh, thank you to the organizers and uh, the co-chairs for the opportunity to share findings uh, uh, from uh, this work uh, that we do in Kenya. And uh, my presentation is uh, really looking at uh, uh, manifestations of stigma uh, in the context of uh, national or exposure prophylaxis uh, uh, scalar program in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, I have uh, no conflict of uh, interest uh, to declare, but uh, just a disclaimer. Uh, that this presentation is illustrated by a number of photographs uh, which are not uh, directly correlated to uh, the findings that I will be uh, presenting uh, in this presentation. Uh, so just quickly is uh, that uh, Kenya included PrEP in national guidelines uh, in 2016 and uh, subsequently uh, we launched a national program uh, in 2017. And uh, what we have witnessed is a very progressive uptake of uh, PrEP uh, particularly among key populations as well as other populations, uh, but also significantly also there's been slow uptake among some uh, subpopulations, for example, adolescent girls and uh, young women. And uh, if we look overall at uh, continuation rates, they've actually been uh, consistently low. And uh, if we look at most of the evidence from uh, clinical trials, uh, demonstration projects, uh, they did uh, allude to the fact that uh, uh, stigma actually was a substantial barrier uh, as far as PrEP delivery was concerned. And so essentially we sought to understand uh, how stigma PrEP use is actually experienced uh, in the context of uh, a national scalar program which is uh, within routine service delivery uh, to enable us to uh, work towards improving uh, PrEP outcomes. Uh, so what I present here is uh, work in the context of uh, the Gilinda project, which is essentially is a four-year uh, PrEP scalar project uh, with a goal of uh, demonstrating effective uh, uh, PrEP integration and delivery at scale uh, within routine uh, service delivery, of course, and in low resource settings. Uh, this project is implemented in 10 out of 47 counties uh, in Kenya, and uh, these are essentially five high incidence and uh, five medium incidence counties. And uh, PrEP is provided through 93 sites, uh, which include uh, about 40% are drop-in centers, that specifically serve key populations. 10% uh, are private facilities, and uh, the remaining 50% are actually public uh, health facilities. Uh, the three primary priority populations for this project, uh, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and adolescent girls and young women, uh, but uh, since the project is implemented in the context of a national uh, scale-up, uh, PrEP is provided to anybody who actually needs it. So we also have zero discordant uh, uh, individuals in zero discordant relationships, as well as individuals from the general population who benefit from uh, PrEP services. And this project anticipated enrolling about uh, slightly less than 21,000 uh, individuals on PrEP. As we speak now, I know we are far much above uh, that anticipated enrollment. So in terms of methods, this was a qualitative study uh, that was nested within the implementation science uh, uh, research in this project. We collected data between October uh, 2017 and November 2018. Uh, that was essentially uh, 22 focus group discussions and uh, 30 in -depth interviews. And uh, the aim of this study was to understand the barriers and facilitate us to both PrEP uptake and continuation, and we obtained the relevant uh, ethical approval. And we essentially sampled uh, both uh, former PrEP clients who had discontinued their PrEP use, current PrEP users, as well as uh, uh, potential PrEP users from the three primary subpopulations I talked about. But we also extended to look at other influences, uh, which includes parents and sexual uh, partners of adolescents and girls and young women, uh, peer educators as well as, uh, as, well as uh, uh, PrEP healthcare providers, and uh, we analyze the data thematically. Uh, these are the social demographic characteristics of uh, the respondents. Uh, quickly, just to point you that majority of the respondents were actually adolescent girls and young women, about 38%. And as you can see, apart from parents of adolescent girls and young women, uh, female sex workers and healthcare providers, who had a mean age above 30 years, uh, the rest of the respondents, actually their mean age was below 30 years. And also uh, there was uh, an equal, fairly equal distribution between men and uh, uh, female respondents. This is a summary of uh, the key findings from uh, this study. Uh, the three key types of stigma that we see that I'll talk a bit more about is uh, product behavior and uh, identity stigma. Uh, the sources of this stigma also, as I'll talk about a bit more, was from the community sexual partners, healthcare providers, peers, and family. And it was actually expressed through labeling stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And I'll also talk a bit more about the outcomes and dramatic impacts 
So in terms of the types of small chama, uh, Sigwali uh, prep uh, regiment, and uh, this is happening in the context where there is entrenched stigma towards HIV within the social fabric, and the induction of prep within that setting, uh, where the packaging of uh, the product resembles uh, the packaging for the regiment, essentially for uh, HIV treatment, and then this attracted a lot of stigmatization towards uh, the product, and as you can see from the quote there from uh, one of the respondents. Uh, the second type of stigma was actually identity stigma. Uh, this was particularly manifested towards uh, female sex workers and the men who have sex with men. Uh, and, and these findings are actually uh, situated within a context where same-sex relationships and uh, sex work is actually criminal within the country, and also the broader social fabric is actually uh, less accommodative. And as a result, we see there was a dense stigma which was uh, perpetuated towards these populations, uh, both from care providers as well as uh, from the surrounding community. Uh, you can see from some of uh, the quotes, actually, from some of uh, the study participants. And the third type of stigma which was largely manifested towards uh, adolescent girls and young women was uh, stigma behavior, particularly the behavior of uh, uh, taking PrEP because the eligibility criteria of, for example, having multiple sexual partners was actually a stigmatized uh, behavior. Uh, some of the findings, for example, is, uh, you can see one of the respondents uh, talking about the mother actually saying that uh, her wanting to use PrEP actually is uh, her wanting to engage in prostitution. Then, in terms of the sources of stigma, stigma actually came from different uh, uh, sources. So there was enacted stigma from peers, from sexual partners, from the family healthcare providers, as well as uh, from the community. But we also saw there was both uh, vicarious as well as internalized and perceived stigma by the users uh, themselves, uh, uh, as uh, actually depicted in that particular diagram. How this stigma was actually expressed, one was uh, prejudice. And a lot of this prejudice was actually from healthcare providers, uh, particularly towards female sex workers and uh, uh, towards MSM. Uh, but we also see discrimination, where particularly when PrEP clients go to the facilities, uh, providers see that as additional work, so they actually made to wait fast. So they can see the other clients, uh, reduce probably the workload before they can actually serve the PrEP clients. We also saw a lot of uh, stereotypes uh, perpetuated from different sources, particularly within the community where uh, PrEP use is actually being uh, uh, likened uh, to actually a promotion of uh, uh, promiscuity as well as labeling. And there was largely two types of labeling, uh, being labeled as being promiscuous or being labeled as being HIV positive simply because the product resembled uh, the regimen that's actually used uh, of HIV treatment. So in terms of what were the key client outcomes as a result of this, one, there was both fear of as well as clients who actually experienced uh, intimate uh, partner violence. And as you can see, the quote there is actually a client who actually expressed fear because she was in a transactional relationship with a much older uh, sexual partner. There was also fear of rejection, both from uh, uh, the intimate sexual partners from family as well as from community. Uh, there was provider discrimination, which uh, the findings have already uh, talked about. There was also loss of business, uh, particularly among female sex workers, and in two forms, either if clients saw the PrEP regiment or some of uh, their peers would actually use that to gain competitive ad advantage by actually disclosing their PrEP use to some of the uh, particularly regular partners, sexual partners of uh, uh, female sex workers. And finally, there was actually shame around PrEP use, and uh, reputational damage. So because of this, we see a lot of clients actually disguised their PrEP use. So in terms of the programmatic impact, what we see is that uh, largely uh, this influenced a lot of PrEP uptake among adolescent girls and young women who feared actually taking PrEP because of stigma. But among key populations, this strongly influenced continuation. And as you can see from some of the quotes, actually, we have a number of clients who are actually stopping their PrEP use as a result of uh, stigma. So in conclusion, stigma was actually a major contribution to uh, people's choices around PrEP initiation and uh, continuation. And as you've seen there, it was actually either stigma about the product, uh, stigma towards the client product, uh, the client's behavior, or stigma towards the client's identity. And you've seen that while this stigma was manifested uh, differently for these diverse populations, uh, it was actually described equally as a major barrier to both uptake and continuation. And it's actually critical for PrEP programs to prioritize interventions that address HIV-related stigma. Uh, most importantly, also sensitivity training uh, for providers becomes quite important. 
And also it's important to actually intensify awareness creation so that uh, uh, PREP is actually normed within these communities. So I conclude by acknowledgments uh, for, to the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation for providing financial and technical support for this project, uh, Gilead Health Sciences for a PREP donation, as well as the other stakeholders who are behind most of the work that I've presented. Yeah, thank you.